Greetings, fellow word travellers. Soon we shall journey back and forth through time to explore the brave new words of cyberspace and to discover how fantasy can become fact, from the enigma of secrets and lies to the origins of a cock and bull story. And can you keep a secret? Well, imagine trying to keep something like this a secret. Hey now, say now, let's get away now. Have you ever wondered why English has become such a global language? Well, one answer may be that it's not really English at all. Apart from some basic Anglo-Saxon, there's Latin, Greek, Norse, German, French, even some Sanskrit, which makes some of our words more than 4,000 years old. Now, some of our most ancient words rub shoulders with laptop, Microchip, mobile phone, alcapops, adhocracy, dumbing down, bung and gotcha. All these buzzwords can now be found in a brand new dictionary of English that brings us bang up to date with all the latest jargon, jive talk and tabloid speak. It even accepts the split infinitive. So, let us boldly go and seek out this new publication. To boldly go is a very good example of a split infinitive. But where is that book? We're going to have to systematically track it down. And here it is, the new Oxford Dictionary of English. And it's the world's first genuinely international dictionary of English. I'm with Ken Mason of Waterstones. Ken, how long does it take to put together a dictionary like this? Well, this particular dictionary took about six years to compile, um, employing 30 editors and up to 60 researchers. How many words has it got then? It's quite thick. Around <laughs> about 350,000. Wow. And how many of those words would you say were kind of buzzwords or words that a lot of people haven't heard of yet? Over 2,000. More than 2,000? Mm -hmm. Well, let's have a look at some of them. I notice you've got a page open here already, and this really caught my eye. P-H-W-O-A-H. -H. How would you pronounce that? I think it's four. Four? And what does it mean? Um, it's defined as used to express desire, especially of a sexual nature. I think we're getting the tone of this book already. <laughs> what about uh, eye candy? That caught my eye. Here we are, eye candy. Visual images that are superficially attractive and entertaining, but intellectually undemanding. Hmm, I hope that doesn't apply to this programme. Well, what about this um, split infinitive business, Ken? It's widely accepted now that the split infinitive has uh, never been grammatically incorrect in English. It is in Latin, but English uh, grammar is quite different to Latin grammar. So, for people who didn't study Latin grammar, the infinitive is the verb form that is preceded by the word to. In Star Trek's case, to go. Put boldly in between the to and the go, and you split the infinitive. One thing's for sure, the English language keeps growing and growing, and more and more people are making use of it. Did you know there are more people in China learning the English language than there are people in America who speak it? English is very much in demand these days, and it's growing so fast, it's even hard for us natives to keep up with it. If we're not careful, we might miss the bus. Bus is a shortened version of omnibus, a Latin word which means for everyone. This omnibus is taking me into Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes is full of examples of new inventions like stop and goes and gyratory circuses. Never heard of them? Well, a gyratory circus is the British name for a traffic circle, like Piccadilly Circus. But it's the American word roundabout that people preferred. On the other hand, the American word stop and goes never really caught on, because people preferred the British word traffic light. It's funny how some words survive and some don't.
Just over 30 years ago, Anthony Greenwood, Minister of Housing, designated 22,000 acres of North Buckinghamshire for the new town of Milton Keynes. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye. Incidentally, Milton Keynes doesn't get its name from a blind poet and an economist. John Milton and Maynard Keynes had nothing to do with it. The name comes from a local village called Milton and the 13th century lord of the manor, Lucas de Keynes. New words are arriving all the time. Sometimes writers make up words for things that haven't even been invented yet. For example, robot is the Czech word for drudgery. And in 1920, a playwright called Karol Kapek wrote a play about people being dehumanized by monotonous work with machinery. He called them robots. There you go, fella. These days, English is the language of technology. 80% of the information stored in the world's computers is in English, and new words keep cropping up on the menu every day. In the early 80s, an American science fiction writer called William Gibson wrote about a network of computers that talked to each other. He called this cyberspace. And if that sounds all Greek to you, well, cyber is Greek, and it means to govern. But I'm not sure who governs the internet. Here in Milton Keynes Cyber Cafe, people use computers to talk to each other on the World Wide Web. Gibson's fantasy has become fact in less than 10 years. Because new technology grows so fast, some old words have to take on new meanings. A mouse used to be a small furry creature that the Anglo-Saxons and myself could easily recognize. But nowadays, it's more likely to be one of these. Well, now we know what a mouse is, but what about a mouse potato? Well, my friends here reliably inform me that a mouse potato is another name for computer nerd. But what about mush and muck? Well, mush stands for multi-user shared hallucination. Sounds like fun. And Muck, multi-user chat kingdom. When I was their age, I used to go down to the pub. Now, what does this thing do? Well, this virtual reality may be good enough for some people, but I prefer the real thing. These awesome machines are amongst the most potent weapons available to a modern army. So how come they ended up with such a nondescript name? The name tank comes from the Indian word for reservoir. When tanks were being developed prior to World War I, they were disguised as portable water carriers and codenamed tanks. One of the most effective anti-tank weapons was invented by Vyacheslav Mikhailovich Skryabin the Soviet foreign minister during World War II. Never heard of him? Well, what about his code name? Molotov. A Molotov cocktail was a bottle of petrol with a rag stuffed in the neck, and you lit the rag and lobbed the bottle at the tank. The bottle burst, the petrol ignited, and it spread all over the tank. Another example of how new inventions use old words is the barrel of this gun. Barrel comes from a 13th century word for anything cylindrical, and the turret that it's mounted on gets its name from a medieval tower. Never mind the overgrown water bucket, this tank is more like a moving castle. Like the computer jargon mush and muck, radar and sonar are also acronyms. Sonar stands for sound, navigation and ranging, which is how you pinpoint a U-boat. And radar stands for radio detection and ranging. But how do you detect someone who doesn't want to be seen? Camouflage was originally a French word, and it only entered the English language this century. It was a slang word for deception, and it came from a much earlier word, camouflé, meaning to snub, or to be more precise, to blow smoke in someone's face. So you could say that wearing camouflage was like blowing smoke in someone's face. Time I got back into mufti.
Like tank, khaki and mufti are also Indian words. Khaki? No. The word khaki comes from Urdu and it means dust coloured. Khaki clothing was an early form of camouflage, first used by the British cavalry in India in 1846. Mufti has come to mean the everyday informal clothes worn by the military when off duty and out of uniform. But there seems to be no one around here at all, in or out of uniform, on or off duty. No wonder this place is one of the best kept secrets of World War II. Oh well, I'd better try the front door. Here in Bletchley Park in Bedfordshire, they know a thing or two about secret codes and how to break them. During World War II, it was the best kept secret of all. Churchill referred to it as his ultra secret, and by 1942, they codenamed it Ultra. Ultra is a Latin word meaning beyond. What's beyond all this? This is the rebuild of Colossus, the world's first ever electronic valve computer. It was called Colossus because, well, it's very big. So big, you can get inside it. And here inside is Tony Sale, the man who rebuilt it. Whoops. <coughs> Tony, how did Colossus come to be? Well, the Germans not only used Enigma to encipher words, they also had another cipher machine called Lorenz. Mm. And this was a very important cipher machine because it was used to, uh, by, by Hitler to his generals. And so it was very important messages that were being sent using it. So how does all this compare with a modern PC? Well, the amazing thing is that the, a, a similar code-breaking task programmed mm. on a modern Pentium PC takes twice as long as this machine did in 1944. But it'll all go on a microchip like that. This odd-looking typewriter is the Enigma, an electrical coding system used by the Germans in World War II. It could produce the most horrendous codes. The Allies had to choose from between 150 million, million, million solutions. The Germans believed it was infallible. Let's see what happens when I type in words. If I press W on the light panel here, we get L, O, and we get Z. R, M, D, and the light shows N, and S, it's decided to show L again. Right, so now I've typed in words, and I've got my cipher text, L, Z, M, N, L. Now, the operator would take this to the Morse code room, the radio room, and send it to another operator. And here, in the radio room, we're listening for Morse code. Morse code was named after Samuel F.B. Morse, but some say he didn't invent the code. He only patented it. Whatever, it seems that he who names it can claim it. So let's get back to the Enigma machine. Having received the cipher text via Morse code, the second operator would check that his Enigma machine was configured exactly the same as the sending machine. In this case, we've chosen AAA, keep it simple. And then he proceeded to type in the cipher text. Yet another way with words. I couldn't leave Bletchley Park without paying my respects to the man who inspired us all with his oratory. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And who gave us such wonderful phrases as, from cradle to grave, the iron curtain, and business as usual. But one of my favourite Churchill witticisms has to be a note written on the margin of a civil service document. This is the sort of English up with which I will not put. And if you've a mind to, up with cock and bull stories you can put in a way with words after the break. That didn't sound right. <laughs> Welcome back. 
This is Stony Stratford in Buckinghamshire, and this is the cock. And this is the bull. And somewhere in between is where cock and bull stories began. In its heyday, this small town had over 60 different coaching inns, because this high street was once the main road between London and the north. They say the great Dr Johnson himself often stayed here at the Cock Hotel whilst he was compiling his famous dictionary. The work took him nine years and contained 43,000 words. It can't have always been exciting work. Johnson even illustrated his definition of dull with the example of compiling a dictionary. Dr. Johnson was just one of a stream of travellers who stayed at these two coaching inns. These guests shared news and gossip that they'd picked up on their travels, occasionally stretching the truth in the cause of a good story. As these tales passed by word of mouth, from the cock to the bull and back to the cock again, they became, well, probably a little exaggerated. Or completely wrong like the message that was sent along the trenches in World War I. Send reinforcements, we're going to advance. But by the time it reached the end, it had become, send three and fourpence, we're going to a dance. Or in this case, a mask. Mask is short for masquerade, a popular form of entertainment that was characterized by song, spectacular display, and dance. The term first appeared at the peak of the Renaissance in Italy. Costume dancers chose partners from among the surrounding spectators, whose identities were hidden behind elaborate masks and disguises. No doubt, many a cock and bull story came from such events. But what an elegant way to travel. And here we are, on our way to a masked ball. Dressed in all our finery, me in my lace and satin, and my companion here in her lace and satin, and corset. Corset comes from the French and literally means little body. But perhaps I should not be the one to explain such a delicate matter. My mysterious companion here will elucidate. Well, certainly. By the mid-18th century, the hoop framework petticoat had changed shape and become oval and was known as the pannier, which is French for basket. It consisted of two basket forms, one on each hip, and was tied tightly together at the waist with tapes. And that was long before Vivian Westwood. Indeed. Either way you look at it, here we are dressed to the nines. And that saying comes from the old English word iron, meaning eyes. So dressed to the eyes became dressed to the nines. <laughs> Of course, in Dr. Johnson's day, the only way to travel was by horse-drawn carriage, from which we get the modern word car. The word coach comes from a small Hungarian town called Koch, spelt K-O-C-S, and there they styled a particularly fashionable carriage called a Koch cart, and this soon spread all over Europe, and it's from Koch cart, or Koch cart, that we get the word coach. The Koch proved to be very popular, and soon the name Coach spread all across Europe. Words travel because people travel. And nowadays, not only do we have trains and boats and planes, we also have cars. Lots and lots of cars. And they all need names. And it's strange how car names seem to follow themes. We have warlike names, Victor, Avenger, Scimitar. Island names, Ibiza, Cortina, Capri. Animals, Jaguar, Mustang, Stag. But many cars, like these Aston Martins, still use words borrowed from coaches. Cabriolet and coupe were both types of horse-drawn carriage. And limousine was a cloak that protected the cart drivers of Limousin in France. And there's more. Boot was an 18th century word for the uncovered space by the steps of the coach where attendants sat, facing sideways. 
and the dashboard was a 19th century word describing a simple piece of wood in the front of a carriage used to keep the mud from being dashed against the passenger's clothes. A dashboard. The very first cars were steam cars and they had to be warmed up before they could start. Chauffeur is a French word meaning to warm up, so chauffeur originally meant warmer-upper. OK, Roger, let's aggravate the gravel. It's good to get out on the open road, but it's a shame. The producer said I'm not allowed to drive because these cars are too expensive. Anyway, my chauffeur today is Roger Stower, a man who knows a thing or two about these beautiful machines. How long have you been driving Aston Martins, Roger? Over 30 years. And it began with, uh, well, it includes the oldest uh, surviving active car called Green Pea. Mm. And it goes all the way up to the most uh, modern project vantage. And you've driven them all? And an awful lot in between. An awful yeah. lot in yeah. between. Yeah. Yeah. And is it true that some of the earlier models, you still had to warm up the engine. Yes, in those days you put an old coat over the radiator and you left yeah. it running and left it running and water temperature would gradually creep up. Yeah. So you still needed a chauffeur in the true sense of the oh, word yeah. to warm it up. Yeah. So how did Aston Martin get its name? Uh, easy, and everybody gets it wrong. Mm. Most people get it wrong. Lionel Martin. Lionel Martin. And Aston Hill which isn't very far from here, where he had particular success with a hill climb version ah. of a Singer motor car that he was selling. Well, thanks, Roger. One last question. Can I have a drive? Mm, I'm not sure. Please. All right, then. Well, so far I've been in a bus, a tank, and a horse and carriage. But this car is by far the most comfortable. I can't quite make Formula One speeds on these back roads, but if this had been 1863, I'd have easily won the Grand Prix, because the first French big prize was actually a race for three-year-old horses. In a way, this stylish car sums up the modern English language, full of new inventions, but with echoes of an elegant past. Well, we've come from jargon to secret codes, from word power to horsepower. But somehow in these good old Anglo-Saxon fields and woods, I get the feeling that cock and bull stories will go on and on and on for as long as we have a way with words. So, farewell until next time, when once again we shall be looking for the truth, the half-truth, and nothing like the truth. Whichever is the most interesting. I'll be the judge of that. You're only jealous. Besides, I couldn't think of a better ending. Well, would you rather take the bus? Bye for now. Hey now, say now, let's get away now. Away with words. Words like we say each and every day Away with words What's in the name? What do you say? So many words at the end of the day I talk, you talk, they talk, we all talk